Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, so today's talk is mainly intended as a brief overview of all kinds of development that has happened that has now led to the fourth main release of, of Relaon. And there might be follow up talks by individuals who, who go in depth on some of the uh, methods development. So if you do follow me on Twitter, you might notice that sometimes I rant about how open software accelerates science. We feel quite strongly that the Cryam field, one reason why it has been al allowed to grow that quickly and successfully in the past uh, half or one decade or so is because of also because of open software packages that have traditionally been developed in the field, which allow everybody to build on each other's progress. And uh, with increasing commercialization in the field, we feel it's important that this is, is protected. So um, hence my uh, ranting on tweet, on Twitter. Let me start with introducing to you the, uh, or you, perhaps you, you know all of them, the uh, Reliant team here at the uh, LMB. So uh, many of you, of course, have interacted with uh, Takanori, who, who keeps uh, track of lots of questions for users and, 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 and gives lots of feedback and help with different people in the, in the lab and, and worldwide. And he's also been very helpful in developing all kinds of things around uh, movie processing, in particular also the ER format uh, that, uh, that was recently developed. Uh, Dari is a postdoc who's been, uh, who during his PhD, the GPU acceleration in Eric Lindahl's group. And uh, I'll, I'll speak about his work on 2D classification uh, algorithms today. Lee is a PhD student who's now writing up and I'll speak about her work on uh, automated class selection. Kirash is a PhD student who will start in October, but he's already a member of our team because he's kind of volunteered as a uh, as a summer student and, and, and still uh, continuing in that uh, uh, aspect now. So Joaquin Oton Orquino uh, is a member of the uh, BRICS group and uh, together with John BRICS and also with Jusenko uh, Zivanov, who was a member of my group, it's now with Henning Stahlberg in, in Basel, uh, have been working on new algorithms for uh, tomogram averaging, which I will uh, speak about today as well. And then Johannes Schwab has a, is a postdoc who has only recently joined, and uh, he will work on uh, deep learning new convolutional neural networks uh, to describe uh, flexibility and motion in a uh, cryon dataset. Now we continue collaboration with Eric Lindahl's group, and also recently we've, we've uh, engaged in a more tighter in, uh, collaboration with the CCPEM team, and I'll, I'll briefly refer to that at the end as well. Good. A new version of Rolan means a new color of the buttons, and that's perhaps the most important part of my talk today. Uh, we've chosen for a strawberry-like uh, color. So if you see uh, Rolan popping up with the pink buttons, that means you're still uh, using uh, Rolan 3.1. And uh, if you source the correct Rolan 4 uh, seashell on public EM Rolan, then you'll get the, uh, the development version, currently the beta version of uh, Reliant 4.8. An overview of all the new features is on this slide. So in the subtomogram averaging, I'll speak about now about from Kino and Jesenko. And then there's various uh, aspects of, of single particle analysis, which I'll speak about next. So since uh, worked together with uh, Tanmay Bharat in uh, Jan Lewis group, We've been doing subtomogram averaging in Rolaon in a more kind of traditional subtomogram averaging way, where you line tilt series, you reconstruct three dimensional large tomograms, and then you extract uh, cubed boxes, which are called these subtomograms, which you then align and average together. With Tanme, we, we, uh, we developed this approach, and the, and the essence of this new approach was the definition of a three dimensional CTF function, which then also acts as a, as a model for the missing wedge. And I think this was a, a, a very useful uh, addition to the field, but there were some uh, problems with it. And uh, basically, the, the 3D CTF model uh, reused a, uh, just a pure sine wave kind of function of 2D slices in in the, that were all put together in the 3D transform. And uh, we've 
realize that that's not entirely the correct way to do it. Some of the problems are that there is no sound statistical assumption that we can make about the uh, signal in the 3D uh, subtomogram voxels. And that boils down to the real problem that the, the actual experimental data are in the 2D tilt series images. There are no 3D subtomograms experimentally. If you want to have sound statistical uh, uh, models for, about the experimental images, you have to go back to the uh, 2D uh, images in the tilt series. And uh, one, one related problem to that is that in order to go from the 2D uh, tilt series images to the 3D uh, tomograms and hence the subtomograms, you have to do some sort of a tomographic reconstruction algorithm. And the effects of that algorithm on the signal transfer into the 3D uh, subtomograms was ignored in the previous uh, approach. And then a, a kind of a practical problem as well is that these original tomograms are often very large and, and, and unwieldy. Now, the idea here is to use a uh, concept of pseudo subtomograms. So we're going to use more or less the same Rulan refined code that we'd written before uh, in the work together with Tanme for doing 3D subtomogram averaging. So we don't have to completely rewrite the Rulan refined program, but we're going to now place the two dimensional Fourier transforms of areas of the tilt series images into a hypothetical 3D Fourier space, which no longer aims to approximate a true three-dimensional density. So whereas this, the, tom the tomogram that we previously reconstructed and the subtomograms that we uh, cut out from there did aim to have true 3D uh, density uh, approximations, for the pseudo subtomograms we've we've kind of let go of that idea. And we just reconstruct these abstract 3D pseudo subtomograms for each particle, but looking at them is not very uh, useful and uh, they no longer then aim to be a, a, this approximation of the 3D density. But we just use them as a trick to reuse the code that already was there in Relan for the 3D uh, refinement. And we do that in a way that we now formulate the problem as if we were using a almost, because it's not entirely true, uh, almost as if we were using all the individual 2D Fourier slices from the relevant areas for each subtomogram in the uh, in the tilt series uh, images. Now, one thing that you you cannot do then is because in the three D Fourier space around the tilt axis, all the Fourier the two D Fourier slices from the individual images will overlap. So along the tilt axis here or here in this this long direction, you'll have a summation of the individual 2D Fourier components from all the tilt series images. And therefore, if you want to uh, want to, to use the sum of these images to get and still have some sort of sound approximation to the noise model in the individual experimental images, you need to keep track how often each uh, voxel in the 3D pseudo subtomograms is measured uh, or some together, and that's what we call the multiplicity. And by keeping track of the multiplicity, so this will depend on the uh, on the geometric uh, kind of the design of your tilt series, of your angles and, and the uh, range and how often you sample these, etc. But we take this into account together with the three-dimensional. Well, this kind of gets taken into account in our three-dimensional CTF model. So this together then allows us to approximate a, a plausible statistical model back to the original noise in the 2D uh, tilt series uh, images. And then, but still be able to use existing methods in Relan for the refinement, the classification, symmetry expansion, multibody, et cetera. And uh, in the, when, after you've done this, existing methods for the refinement, you can then reconstruct your 3D average subtomogram, your, your 3D subtomogram average map, again, by going back to the original 2D uh, tilt series images. And uh, <clears throat> then, and this is 
So the modifications to rely on refine to be able to do this and to deal with this three dimensional CTF model, which also now takes into account the effects of the 3D reconstruction algorithm. Uh, that work was done by Kino. And then uh, together also with uh, Jasen Kozivinov, who then wrote his, uh, he kind of adapted his algorithms for the Bayesian polishing and the CTF refinement that he'd previously written for single particle analysis to now work with these kind of pseudo subtomogram images. And that means you can now, if you've reconstructed this 3D average from all the uh, uh, pseudo subtomograms, you can use this improved 3D reference to do a realignment of the tilt series parameters kind of rigidly or non-rigidly in, in, uh, to account for beam induced motion during the tilt series uh, acquisition. And you can also use these algorithms for CTF refinement to optimize the foci, but even things like uh, 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 trefoil and tetrafoil if, if, if the resolution of your average uh, uh, is high enough. So all of this has been implemented in a pipeline, which now looks very much like the single particle pipeline. So if you, in Relan 4, if you do Relan minus minus TOMO, you get a separate uh, tomography GUI, which has some of the uh, of the uh, job types that people are familiar with from uh, a single particle, like initial model generation, classification, auto refine, multi body, etc. But others are specific for the uh, subtomogram uh, pipeline. For example, import procedures, which work from uh, in the initial reconstructions in IMOD and these uh, this job type, for example, to prepare these pseudo subtomograms, which will read in the original raw align tilt series and then uh, do the uh, do the uh, pseudo subtomogram reconstructions, which can then be fed into the refined program to do all the, the tasks that people were uh, accustomed to do in Relan single particle or subtomogram averaging already. Now, this tomogram frame alignment is kind of the rigid registration of the, uh, of the tilt series alignment using the, the algorithms akin to the Bayesian polishing in single particle alignment. And you can do this also per particle to let go of the rigidity, in which case it would be much, much more similar perhaps to the actual Bayesian uh, polishing in Roland with very similar uh, uh, sigma values for the priors of how, how much individual particles can move from each other. CTF refinement, again, akin to the one in the single particle uh, analysis. And most useful for now is actually to be able to refine the focus values for the individual uh, pseudo subtomograms. But you can do uh, odd and even aberrations to, to higher orders uh, as much as, as the data that you have at hand would allow. Currently, only I think April Ferret and data from Dmitry Tegunov's M paper is actually uh, shown to have a significant uh, benefits from these higher order aberration refinements. So, by having these uh, tools of refinement classification on the one hand and the polishing and the CTF refinement on the other hand, you can again, just like you do in single particle, iterate these methods get better references from alignment and use those better references to do the polishing and the CTF refinement, go back with those improved uh, parameters to do even better refinement, etc. And these are just some preliminary uh, results from Kino and Jasenko where they use the HIV immature data set from John Briggs, which is kind of a, a model a data set for subtomogram averaging, and they see they get they get better results than uh, what John could get using his existing algorithms. Okay, then that uh, makes me move on to the uh, single particle analysis. First thing here that has changed. Uh, I'm going through this in order of what you would actually use the programs in a typical um, structure determination project. Is uh, I've written a wrapper to the Topaz auto-picking and denoising program. And this is software developed by uh, Tristan Babler in Bonnie Berger's group. Alex Noble is, in, is, is much involved from the New York Structural Biology Center here too. So they have this uh, deep learning method where you have, to, uh, you have to pick only a few particles in the micrographs and then you can train this neural network to pick uh, particles that look like it. And they also distribute some pre-trained networks that they've 
trained on, on existing data sets. So, uh, and another thing, more recent uh, work here is to use uh, noise to noise denoising of, of uh, micrographs, and that has also been implemented. So, uh, the denoising of micrographs is implemented in the manual picking, where you now have this extra op option where instead of low or high pass filtering your micrographs to make your particles look nicer. Uh, for manual picking, you can use the topaz denoising, and uh, you have to tell it where uh, topaz is. This is the uh, direction on on uh, on Jake's uh, Linux system. And just to show you kind of how that looks like, this is the beta gal tutorial data set. This is a low pass image. I think at 20 angstroms of that of those data, and this is the topaz denoised uh, image. So. Whether you like this better for manual picking or this, or for looking what's going on with your micrographs, I guess will be a matter of taste, but at least uh, you can play with this option. So this used the pre-trained network that uh, I think uh, Alex and his people have uh, trained on multiple data sets. So the auto picking is then uh, now topaz based auto picking as a true wrapper inside the auto picking job type, much like we have true wrappers to GCTF and UCF uh, motion core two in the previous steps here. So there is a, there's a whole tab here on the IO you said you use topaz auto picking and then uh, uh, these are the options, you can use uh, topaz to train if you set this to yes, then you can you can previously have manually picked coordinates which you think are very nice particles and you the output node from that manual picking you can give here and then you can train the topaz neural network to uh, recognize particles that look like that or and i'll show you an example uh, in later for the beta gal you could run 2d classifications on on a log picked or kind of other kind of automated picking and then you could select all the good particles from 2D class averages and then, for example, retrain Topaz to on the selected set of particles and uh, get your uh, your network that way. Once you have a network, uh, you can then uh, a trade network, you can use Topaz picking by providing that network here. Or if you say Topaz picking and you leave the network, uh, the trade model empty, then it will just use the pre-trained model that comes with Topaz itself. So you don't need to do training if you want to do fully automated stuff and you think Topaz model itself is good enough, you can just go straight to Topaz picking and not use any model. Again, many options here, and I guess it will depend on, on the projects at hand, which ones work best, and people can just uh, play with this. Just to show you the uh, results for the uh, beta gal tutorial, this is the, the results of, a, of the standard default settings that are recommended in the tutorial for a Laplacian of Gaussian picking, basically blob-based picking. So you'll see you get these false positive in, in, in high contrasty features. And this is the result from a topaz picking from blue, what topaz thinks is most likely to be a particle to purple, what is less likely. And you can play with this threshold if you click the right, house, right mouse button in the manual picking or the visualization of, of coordinates, you can set the threshold. I, I set it to zero here. So you, you no longer pick this, the false positives here, although this one still seems to be picked. So again, how useful this uh, will be will depend on, on the project. Now, Dari has written a, a new algorithm for uh, classification and refinement. So this is 2D or 3D classification and auto refinement. Uh, the most mature of this is, and, and the best tested now is the 2D classification. And that's already available on the GUI in the line 4.0 uh, not as it is now. And then perhaps as we go from, from beta to stable, we'll, uh, will expand this to auto refinement and 3D classification as well. So this algorithm is gradient driven. So uh, it depends on an online estimation of current noise levels. And for those of you who are familiar with this optimizing uh, optimization algorithms from uh, deep learning, it's basically similar to the Adam algorithm as compared to stochastic, stochastic gradient descent optimization. So that and, and we've confirmed this with the uh, legal team here also makes it kind of different enough from uh, the SGD algorithm that has been patented in uh, Structura uh, uh, owned patent. So we hope, whereas there was all kind of disclaimers in the Reliant 3.2 code for usage by commercial 
users, they have to dis deactivate certain options. We, we, we think we can get rid of that for the next uh, uh, stable release of Alarm 4. Now, uh, one thing that's not on the clear on the GUI yet, we may need to change this still, is that you run this not with, it, with the standard 25 iterations that people would run normal 2D classification with, but now you run 50 to 100. But each iteration is a much smaller subset of the particles. So this starts, depending on how big your data set it's, is, it starts with only a few hundred or thousand particles, and then only the very last iteration will pass over the entire data set. And that makes this algorithm a lot faster than the uh, existing expectation maximization algorithm in RELAM, especially if you have many particles. So I think the, for me, the most striking example there was when in, during the first coronavirus lockdown when Katerina from Chris Russell's lab was doing the RNA polymerase uh, and they collected for two weeks at the, at the West Cambridge site and had, I don't know, 10 or 15 million particles. Dari did a 2D classification job, which gave better results than the EM algorithm in only uh, three or four hours on, a, on one of our GPU nodes, whereas the EM algorithm with that many particles would have run for more than a week, I think. So if the data sets are not 10 million, but say 100 or 200 or 300,000 particles, still the speed ups are very, very important, almost an order of magnitude in some cases. So just to show you in the results, this is a uh, one data set from Empire, it's Aldenase, I think 200 KV, probably from Gabe Landers lab. And this is the result from the EM algorithm. You typically see that quite a few classes become empty and uh, that's something that Dari's also worked on that no longer happens. And perhaps as a result of that, or because of the gradient driven algorithm, not entirely sure, you now get much more different useful classes uh, so you get better separation into distinct classes and no longer you get any, you, you typically don't get uh, any or many of these uh, empty classes. So what we hope is for single particles, the new 2D classification will be a real advance, which works a lot faster, but actually gives you better classes uh, to look at. Good. Then uh, Lee and Adari and myself, we've also been involved have been working on this uh, automated uh, 2D class selection because this is in the round three, up to round three is kind of the most user intensive part of it. The user has to make a decision which 2D classes are good and which ones are bad and to then select good particles to bring forward to 3D refinement. Now, if you want to, all, to do all these things fully automated, and I understand that more people uh, would like to do that, then these kind of decisions would be uh, stand in the way of, of, um, of processing your data without human intervention. So that was kind of the motivation of this project. So <clears throat> what Lee came up with in the end is to have a combined approach where we use both features, um, and there's a total of 24 features, and these include data that are not present in the 2D images themselves, like Relance estimates of the accuracy of rotation, and translation, the, what Relance thinks is the resolution of an image, how many particles have actually contributed to this 2D class average, etc. So these are data that are really complementary to the actual 2D class average images themselves, but also uh, image, some features that we calculate from the images themselves. So these are intrinsically part of the image, but we still find that auto masking images into protein and solvent areas and look at, at, at moments of, of density around in a ring at the outside of the particle are all useful information to express into features because probably because these are the kind of things we really uh, care for in images. So we can combine that with a more standard convolutional neural network and then concatenate at the, at the final layer all these uh, the output from the neural network with the features and then do fully connected to predict one class score for a 2D class average image together with the features that, that came from the Relan optimizer uh, uh, star files. Now, Lee actually looked at about, uh, well, probably more than this, but in the end, 15,000 more or less 2D class average images uh, manually. These were collected over more or less three years at the LMB. So you had this pop-up option in Relan, which was introduced quite a while ago. Do you want to save these 2D class of images to help us train our uh, algorithms? 
If you did so, thank you very much. Uh, this was very uh, useful for Lee's project. And Lee looked at all of them and gave them all a, a, a score ranging. This is a continuous score ranging from zero very bad class averages to one uh, uh, very, very good one. So once here would be beautiful 2D class average images of ribosomes or splicesomes with lots of details in them. And zero would be the very bad images of of very small classes that Rilan would uh, spit out for many projects as well. So this has been implemented in the subset selection job type where under class options, you can now say automatically select 2D classes. You just say this to yes. So on the IO, you just, you provide the model or the optimizer star file. And then you just have to provide a threshold for the auto selection. And the higher the threshold, the more picky you will be. So 0.5 is kind of average uh, if you, at early stages of processing and you still want to not throw away too much, you might drop this down to 0.35 or something. And then you just have, you, you need a Python executable with certain uh, libraries like Torch and NumPy and the one in Topaz, which we now have anyway, seems to work fat fine. So this uh, can be inserted here. And then just to show you again, results for the BTGAL tutorial data set. These are now with the predicted score from Lee's program here in, in the white number. So this is, this is called a pretty good 2D class averages. And then it, it's sorted so they could become ever worse. And if you would have used the 0.5 criterion, then you would have taken these up to here. If you would have set this to 0.35, like I said, then you would have taken up to here. So where you want to make the cut is still a, a user-defined uh, variable. But hopefully uh, you'll agree that more or less this kind of ranking makes sense. Cool. Then uh, one of the last new features is the improved uh, schedules and on the fly processing, which is something I did myself. So there's a new Relan.py GUI where you can uh, say, where you can automatically do motion correction, CTF estimation, extraction of particles, auto picking, 2D classification, and if you want even 3D refinement, either giving a reference or calculating one uh, de novo. So you just have to give the, uh, the, uh, all the parameters that you need for this. So what's the symmetry? How big is your particle? Based on this, you get suggestions, how big your box could be, but you can change these values and, and do something else. <clears throat> and then inside it will do uh, picking and uh, you can do these automated 2D selections based on, on the score. So it will run two schedules and the one is called the prep schedule, which just iterates over importing movies, doing Reliant Core 2 and CTF Find 4.2. And it will just do this on a loop uh, ever, as your data comes in. <clears throat> and in parallel, you run a second schedule called the processing schedule proc. And this will iterate, it will select all the micrographs over, that have CTF signals over a given resolution, which is an input parameter. And then if you want, you can retrain the Topaz network automatically by doing an initial Laplacian of Gaussian picking extract particles if you have more than, for example, 5,000, do 2D classification, select the good classes, and then retrain the Topaz network. And once you've done that, you have a retrained network, you can then Topaz pick the entire data set, do extraction, 2D class averaging, selection again of the best classes, and then do uh, even 3D refinement, or if you don't have, if you have a model, if you don't have a model, you can generate it automatically from the data. And this it will just do on a loop as data come in on ever bigger uh, sets of data. By using Diary's algorithm, this whole loop could still be relatively quickly done. <clears throat> so there is this new Reliant Schedule GUI.py program, which then monitors the execution of these schedules. And as, as it's running, you will see what the process is doing. You could have the normal Reliant GUI open in another window, and you'll see that magically jobs will start to appear and become active and running and finish, etc. And this scheduling is a kind of underlying motor that runs all of that. And you can, you can stop these processes here. You could then change some of the parameters of the jobs and uh, then restart it again. And then this, the, the GUIs and the, and the scheduler system is smart enough to kind of realize which jobs you've changed parameters on and which jobs depend on those. And those will then all be rerun, but jobs that you haven't touched and where parameters haven't changed will just continue to uh, run like they were. So hopefully this will be 
a, a useful way to uh, process your data on the fly. And it's, it's part of the system that Gregory is now using at the EM facility to run the on the fly processing uh, there. So just a quick result from the beta gal tutorial. You can do this fully automated in about one hour or so. You can import the movies, do all this thing, and then get all the way to, to Nyquist resolution reconstruction, completely automated from the data uh, 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 as it comes in. <clears throat> now, the last uh, new thing uh, before I uh, finish up uh, is that, and this is more under the hood, the normal users for now won't notice so much. But if you look in the default, pipeliner.star file, you'll see that all the names of the nodes and the processes, et cetera, will have changed. And that's because of work with the CCPM team, in particular, Matja Danza, but Colin and, and Tom are, are providing a lot of input too. Uh, to be, to, and the idea here is that uh, the CCPM software project will actually adopt the rely on pipeliner approach with the corresponding star files to have a CCPM pipeliner, which will be much wider. It will not only include uh, rely on jobs, but also all the follow-up jobs of, of doing uh, atomic model building and, and refinement in CUDE and RAFMAC and all the other programs that are part of the CCPM suite. And the longer term view is that on top of this pipeliner approach, which will be used to launch individual jobs, et cetera, there will be a CCPM new CCPM GUI which will ultimately in the longer run replace the Relan GUI and everything will be inside one big CCPM uh, software package, which can be then used uh, to, to uh, run projects that go all the way from the raw CryM data to uh, PDB submission and, and model validation. And this project is partially funded by the global phasing company uh, from uh, Gerard Vulcogne. <clears throat> Good. All the new documentation of Relyon is no longer on the uh, on the wiki page. So the wiki page will will move to this new uh, setup, which is called Relyon.readthedocs.io. And you can, the nice thing is, you can have different versions. So there's already a version for 3.1, and we're now building the version for release 4.0. But you can just click on the arrow down here, and you'll see a single particle tutorial, which has explanations of the new algorithms I explained today, but there's also Kino has made a, a subtongram averaging tutorial. So those of you who are keen to try that out, you should definitely check out, it's just fallen off the screen here, but there is a link to this to subtongram averaging tutorial as well. Ooh. So this is the question I most often get, when will this be openly available? You guys here in the LMB can all use it. So on public EM, rely on, and then rely on for dev.cshell. If you source that, you'll use it. Uh, if you're not at LMB, we hope to go open beta uh, before the summer break. Please be patient. Several projects have caused, have, have suffered from delays caused by uh, personal circumstances of people involved due to COVID. And, uh, but yeah, we're, we're getting there. It's almost there. So that brings me to my acknowledgement slides, the team of the people here, people at CCPM Global Phasing I've mentioned. So Gregory and Giuseppe have been very helpful with their on the fly processing uh, attempts or kind of developments at the EM facility and, and chats with them have been very useful for feedback. I thank you all who have clicked those buttons to share your 2D class averages for uh, Lee's project. Rafa Leiro, who's now in, who was previously with Maynard Lammers here at the LMB, now in Madrid at the CNIO, has been very helpful for early testing with Relan 4. And of course, Jake and, and Toby for keeping all the computational projects or the computational infrastructure running so that we can actually uh, do all this work. So thank you very much for your attention and be happy to.